thank you very much guys for once again for being here. And Chris, take it away. Cool. <clears throat> well, yeah, it's my second time ever coming to San Francisco. And when I was growing up, I grew up in Connecticut. My mother, she came here in 1974. And when she heard I was moving out to California, she said, Christopher, don't go to San Francisco. The Manson family's up there, all kinds of crazy stuff. But uh, it's a beautiful city. I really like it. I'm really enjoying the food. And thank you all for having me. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. <clears throat> I want to pose a question to you. Uh, several years ago, when I was competing in bodybuilding, I was eating a diet of oatmeal, lean meat, sweet potatoes, and rice. And yet, I was still putting on <coughs> fat. And then, several months ago, I did an experiment where I ate nothing but steak and pancakes. And I got lean and more muscular. Why? How does this happen? Timing. How? What was that? The timing. The timing? OK, explain. Um, if you eat your carbs post-workout, your body will more absorb them for muscle development, rather than if you take it at a resting state, your body will turn it into sugar and then fat. Okay, that's good. Do we know the mechanism by how that happens? Okay. <laughs> Who knows what insulin does in the body? Converts glucose to fat. Not only does it convert glucose to fat, it transports nutrients to where they need to go in the body. It's the regulator. It is a hormone that partitions nutrients, which is what this talk is about. It tells you know the body how to use carbohydrates. It tells the body whether they go to muscle or liver, liver glycogen or whether they go to your fat stores. Um, it tells, it actually um, is also released when you drink a protein shake or when you eat protein. Protein is also insulogenic. Um, so insulin is a factor that we don't really think about when we're eating something. Classically we've been told calories in, calories out, when we eat too much we're going to get fat. The problem is not one of amount it's one of efficiency. If you look at diabetics, um, people who are in pre-diabetic states, they have a problem with efficiency. Their bodies do not know how to respond to carbohydrates efficiently. So that causes problems. It causes problems with the blood sugar, causes problems with the brain, causes problems with inflammation. So when we think about weight loss, muscle building, um, and general health, what we need to think about is efficiency, okay? Um, my background as a trainer, I started personal training when I was in graduate school. And uh, you know, I did some time in the Marine Corps and I studied uh, international politics. And um, when I got into that field of study, um, I studied something called rational choice theory. Uh, does anybody know what that is at all? Basically, it's a mathematical theory. Uh, that talks about efficiency, talks about efficiency of decision, and how to get what you call an equilibrium solution. So when I derive my questions, a lot of the questions that people ask, like, you know, research questions, are carbohydrates bad to eat after 5 p.m.? Um, should we eat this amount of carbohydrates? Should we eat this amount of carbohydrates? Um, I think it's more of a question of when is the most optimal time to eat carbohydrates? When is the most optimal time to eat protein and when is the most optimal time to eat fats? Because it is an economy problem. Carbohydrates in particular express this economy problem because we only have a limited amount of space in our muscle cells and in our liver cells to hold carbohydrates. So you take a 150 pound man, completely glycogen depleted, that average 150 pound man, and I'm talking 150 pounds of lean mass, not a fat mass, um, will only be able to hold about a thousand calories of carbohydrates in the muscle cells and the fat cells. Um, so when we think about, not muscle cells and fat cells, mu muscle cells and liver cells, when we think about carbohydrate use, it's, a, it's an economy of space problem. <coughs> and so when I 
start to look at this question, um, I wanted to pose it like a game, a rational choice game. And it's a game between you and your body, okay? You eat something. Just because you eat a carbohydrate or some protein, lean protein, doesn't necessarily mean that your body is going to use it for that purpose. It has to go through that door of insulin. So this is you up here, X. You eat something with a certain nutrient value. And then insulin tells it whether it's going to go to glycogen or if it's going to go to your fat cells. Um, and I created a little reward down here. Um, if it goes to glycogen, meaning it's going to go to your muscle cells, you both get one point. If it goes to your fat cells, your body gets one point, but you get negative one point because that's not what you want, all right? And that's an issue here because a lot of us think that because being less fat is considered healthy, we think that that's what our bodies want to do. It's quite the opposite. In our evolution, our bodies have learned, have survived because of our ability to store fat and move around, right? Fat doesn't use up much energy. It helps you to get through periods when you don't have food, which through our natural history, we had long periods of time when we did not have food. Um, and it allows you to move across long distances um, without using energy and, and uh, uh, without food. So, sorry if that was repetitive. Muscul muscular tissue, on the other hand, robs us of energy. It takes a lot of energy to hold on to muscle. So your body doesn't necessarily want that. When you go through times of stress and your cortisol levels go up, the first thing that gets taken away is muscle. Um, and your body starts to try and hold on to fat. So in this game, we have to convince the body. We have to convince the body that it's going to be optimum to store these nutrients in the muscle cells rather than the fat cells. So, we want to think of times when our cells are going to respond most to that hormone insulin, right? Now, there's something very big here. It's called insulin sensitivity. I got two master's degrees, I got a PhD work in, and I'm having some stomach problems. Sorry. Um, and then insulin resistance. Now, we think to put the problem most simply, insulin sensitivity happens when your glycogen is completely depleted. Now when is that? Does anybody know? After a workout. After a workout, right? So, I have workout W here, and this is an efficiency curve. If you go over the curve, you're <coughs> gonna end up storing that as fat, um, as far as uh, carbohydrates go. And if you go under the curve, you're gonna be too skinny. You want to be right on the curve, right? Um, the curve goes up and then it goes down. And we think about times when it's going to be most optimal to eat carbohydrates or the, most, the times when we can eat the most carbohydrates and get actual use out of them. It's going to be after a workout because your glycogen is completely low. I'm trying to get too, not too math nerdy here, but this is essentially a calculus problem, right? We're trying to get to the most efficient point on the curve where we get the most carb most use of, out of our carbohydrates without spilling over. Um, and so, insulin sensitivity happens when we do not have glycogen in our cells. Now, the other problem with this is, say you eat eight times a day, like most bodybuilders do, and say you're eating carbohydrates at every meal. Whether those carbohydrates are good carbohydrates or bad carbohydrates, what are you doing every time you eat? Your body is releasing insulin, right? And so on every cell, there is a receptor site, right? The receptor sites on the cell membrane, that's where insulin goes in order to put 
a nutrient inside the muscle cell, right? If insulin is constantly bombarding these cells and the cell membrane has to respond, what happens? You get desensitized. It gets desensitized, right? So you get something called insulin resistance. Um, the cells stop responding and fat, the, the glucose that gets doesn't turn into glycogen in your muscle cells, it gets stored in your fat cells, right? So when we think about this, again, um, the best time, that's gonna fall all the time, um, the best time to eat carbohydrates is going to be within a two hour window after your workout, right? Now, that's the simplest way of explaining this, right? And um, I wanna ask you if you have any questions before I move on, um, in case I'm confusing anybody with this math mumbo jumbo and stuff like that. Anybody have any questions? Okay. So, as I said, this is the simplest way of explaining this. Um, that's not necessarily the case. And the reason is because of something called chronic inflammation. I have a condition called ulcerative colitis, um, which is related to Crohn's disease, and uh, it's an autoimmune inflammatory bowel disease, basically. And that is a product of inflammation. I'm not sure if anybody else um, has or heard of these diseases. Um, but when I was competing as a bodybuilder, um, I got to a point where I would put food into my body and my body would just attack itself. It did not respond well. I had all kinds of issues and it got to the point where I couldn't go anywhere without running immediately for a toilet after I ate um, and going about 30, 40, 50 times a day. Um, and what it didn't know at the time was that my body was responding to the carbohydrates that I was eating in this way because it wasn't able to actually recognize that they were food, right? So if you hear of people with celiac disease or gluten sensitivities, um, <coughs> these are things that happen to us that create low level of inflammation, right? They're going to um, force your body to kind of attack itself. Now, not everybody has autoimmune diseases. They actually affect a very small amount of the population, but most of us, probably as much as 40 to 50% of the population on this earth has some sort of gluten sensitivity. Um, that's because wheat has been continuously mutated and um, grown for production rather than consumption, right? And so when we have um, this kind of Frankenstein food going into our bodies, our bodies react in ways that we would not expect. Things like whole grains. Um, uh, Steve Jobs was on a whole grain diet while he had his cancer. And he was trying to take as many as 10 servings of whole grains a day because he thought they were anti-cancer. In reality, it probably sped up his cancer and led to uh, his demise. Um, so when I prescribe diets to people, when I put diets together for people, I do not include gluten. Um, and this is because I don't know if they have that issue or not. I don't know if they have that sensitivity or not. When you eat anything with that combination of sugar and omega-6 oil, um, that leads to not only inflammation in, in um, uh, you know, creating fat, but it can also lead to neurological disorders down the line. It can also lead to things like arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, any autoimmune disease that you have, the latent symptoms can come up. And so that's why I suggest really take, really watching what types of carbohydrates you put in your body. Fats. Um, fats, as they said in the lecture earlier, are going to delay your gastric emptying at times, right? And it's really great to combine your um, uh, foods with fats and proteins and things like that. The thing is, um, a lot of us, why do we, why do we eat carbohydrates? What is the number one reason why people say we eat carbohydrates? Fuel energy. Fuel energy, right? The reality is that you have one carbon atom 
for every oxygen atom in a couple hydrogen. That's by definition, right? So because you have one carbon atom for every oxygen atom, what do we do very easily every time we breathe? We burn carbohydrates. Just by sitting here, right now, we're burning carbohydrates. That makes them an energy source, an immediate energy source, but they're not a very good long-term energy source. And so I actually suggest not looking at carbohydrates as an energy source. I look at them as a glycogen replenishment tool. It's a way of reinvigorating our cells after our workouts. And so that's another reason why the only time I suggest eating carbohydrates is post-workout. Coming into the workout, some of you are probably thinking, well, if I go into a workout without any carbs, then where's my energy going to come from? Fats. Fats um, are a really good long-term source of energy. <clears throat> are you going to get the pumps and the veins that you normally would while you're, uh, while you're all pumped up on glycogen? No, you're not. But the reality is that that pumps, that, that thing you're looking for there, it's kind of like a false sense of security. You're still hitting the muscle cells. The fats, on the other hand, they're going to take about nine hours for you to metabolize. They're going to take about nine hours for you to oxidize, oxidize in your body because there isn't an oxygen atom for every, carbo for every carbon atom in the fat. They are, um, uh, what's it called? They burn a lot slower. What we forget sometimes is that it's actually an organ. Every fat cell is an organ. It produces hormones. These hormones tell our brain how to act, okay? Um, women who have fat around their thighs and butts, um, that acts completely different than fat around the midsection. Fat around the midsection is actually associated with this thing called chronic inflammation. Uh, and that's because fat stores toxins. These toxins get released into the bloodstream. They tell our brain how to act. And um, that fat around the, the midsection is largely responsible for um, a whole host of uh, diseases that come from inflammation. You're much more likely to get cancer. You're much more likely to have heart disease. You're much more likely to have a neurological disorder with belly fat. Um, fat around the thighs and uh, uh, butt, on the other hand, that is more of a hormonal issue, um, usually from estrogen or something like that. Um, and uh, when we think about it, you are actually much more healthy um, with that type of fat than you would be if you had fat around your um, And this relates to insulin sensitivity because belly fat, this is a way to think about things if you are uh, trying to get into a diet. If you have a large degree of fat around your belly, it probably means you have some degree of insulin resistance, um, chronic insulin resistance, right? And that means that when I deal with people with chronic insulin resistance, I do not have them eat carbohydrates at all post-workout. Um, I actually uh, probably wouldn't have them eat carbohydrates until the second meal after the workout. And the reason is because at that point, I want those hormones. Um, uh, I don't want insulin to be blocking any growth hormone or um, any of the other hormones that are going to help me get lean. The problem that comes if you go on a very low carb diet, um, there's another hormone called leptin uh, that uh, is secreted by our fat cells. And it tells our brains when we've had too many calories, it tells our brains, all right, you've got to release more thyroid hormone for us to uh, get rid of some of these fats. The way we attack this is every three or four days, I'd have the client go a little bit higher carbohydrate. So that way we can replenish leptin. But people who tend to be obese also tend to be not only insulin resistant, but leptin resistant. Because every time they eat, they release leptin, the brain stops responding. Okay? Any questions? I don't know what you said, everybody. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. pretty much everything you're explaining is it talking about each person has a different way of carb cycling? Like, um, not just a different carb cycling. What I'm trying to get you to understand is that, is that it's not so easy to say that, um, you know, I'm going to go on this diet, I'm going to eat these carbohydrates, and this is what my body's going to do with it. You have to pay attention to what you're going to right? Because it doesn't necessarily mean, I've seen people go on um, the cleanest diets in the world. Um, 
um, I've seen people um, kept slaving away trying to uh, uh, go on super low calorie diets for years, not cheating on them, and still putting on weight for not losing weight at all. And it's because of what we're seeing here, insulin resistance. When people are insulin resistant, their bodies do not react to the hormones like they should. They do not store nutrition like they should. Everything is inefficient. So when we see somebody who is obese, that is an inefficiency problem. Your body does not know what to do. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so. Uh, I have one question. Um, you say like when people have gut and you tend to not put them on a carb cycle, after their workout, so right. when do you put them on the cycle? I would have them, so yeah, if people tend to have fat around the midsection, um, the only time I would have them eat carbohydrates is after a really hard workout. Because you have to remember, we're not always burning off tons of glycogen when we train. Um, I, I know on my shoulder days, I, I mean, I kill my shoulders because I love my shoulders, but um, I probably burn, burn off like a quarter of the glycogen in my body. You know, on a late day, on the other hand, I'm completely freaking dead. Right. You know what I mean? So, uh, so uh, after a late day, I'd probably probably have them uh, have some carbohydrates or a really hard back day. But um, uh, you know, uh, it, it's really client dependent. You know, and, and when I put plans together, I don't have like a cookie cutter thing that I do. Um, everything depends on the client schedule. Everything depends on how the their life is because I mean I work with all types of people that work with bodybuilders but most of my clients they're busy people executives and things like that so I have to revolve everything around the time so generally you're gonna have the your clients mostly on a protein fat diet up until the point they work out and that's the only time they can really take in the carb and right. typically would that be like more of a starch sheet type carb or complex carb or more of a simple sugar like from fruit or? Um, I like white rice and yams. Okay. Uh, sweet not orange yams, but sweet potatoes um, and potatoes. I do not um, really prescribe a lot of fruit. Um, the only time I really prescribe, and it's because it's interesting because this comes up to the question. Um, the only time I'm, I really use fruit, if you um, read my book, it's in the first phase of the diet. And the reason why I use fruit in the first phase of the diet, and I'll actually give up to about three or four servings a day, um, and that's only for about 10 days, is to actually get the appetite going. Because your body, when um, insulin spikes, all of a sudden it robs your uh, blood stream of sugar, and then you get hungry. So getting people used to eating food again, I will include fruit in the diet. Otherwise, no, never more than one serving a day. Um, as far as, uh, Carbohydrates. I don't really like brown rice because it sits in the mm -hmm. intestinal tract a very long time. Um, can actually take a lot of acid um, to to digest it, and um, it's, it can cause some intestinal problems and things like that. I love quinoa. Um, I think quinoa is great, but again, I tend to keep keep people away from barley, rye, oats, or wheat, or stone. If someone's insulin resistant, is there a way to help them reverse that, or is yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Um, a very, very low carbohydrate diet. Um, there are some supplements. So it's like ketosis type diet, or yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so there are certain supplements that are very good for increasing insulin sensitivity, um, and these are also highly anti-inflammatory supplements. Um, one is turmeric. Turmeric's an ancient spice. Um, it's super cancer beneficial, uh, meaning it's, it's an anti-cancer um, nutrient. Um, it has a compound in it that helps um, insulin shuttle nutrients across the cells. Um, and it's highly anti-inflammatory. Uh, if you have joint problems, for instance, I think the supplement you have is a joint uh, formula. Um, Turmeric's actually in that. Um, I take about 1,000 milligrams a day um, and I only take it in foods where I have fat because it is fat soluble. Um, the other one is um, alpha lipoic acid. Spelling again. Um, 
That's an A. Sorry. <laughs> now it looks less like an A, but <laughs> uh, alpha lipoic acid uh, it is actually um, very good for insulin resistance. Um, again, it helps. Uh, it's an amino acid that helps insulin to show nutrients into the cell. Um, I take about 300 milligrams um, a day, or 300 milligrams three times a day. Um, so I'll have it usually in the morning. Uh, I'll have it with my lunch um, and have it after my work. Um, uh, fish oil, omega-3. About 1,000 milligrams a day. I would not take fish oil within three hours of workout. Um, the reason I would not take fish oil within three hours of a workout is because it is highly anti-inflammatory and you want a good amount of acute inflammation after the workout. That's what helps you build muscle. So I would take it either three hours before or three hours after the workout, um, but not within three hours. Uh, vitamin D. Vitamin D, uh, all of us are deficient in vitamin D, um, most of the population is, and um, I take about 2,000 to 3,000 IU of that a day. High levels of anything that's gonna be, that, that'll raise your cortisol. So like coffee, if you're drinking like eight to 10 cups of coffee a day, um, then you're probably gonna have a, a problem with insulin resistance down the line. If uh, one or two cups of coffee are great for you because they're full of antioxidants and stuff like that, but just avoid high levels of caffeine, high uh, alcohol intake. Um, again, that's going to raise your chronic inflammation. Um, that could probably lead to insulin resistance. You look like you're a little yeah. uneasy about that one. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I ran into my favorite bottle of scotch last night, so I, uh, <laughs> I don't want to. You're lucky I didn't fall over while speaking up <laughs> But uh, yeah, um, definitely don't want to be drinking too often. And then uh, making sure you have water, lots of water. Um, if you are not hydrated, then your body is not going to process the nutrition like it should. Um, that will increase lo uh, levels of insulin resistance. Um, there's a huge thing on YouTube right now. And I don't know if you guys follow me on YouTube or follow anybody else on YouTube or anything like that, but there's a bunch of guys eating pop tarts and stuff like that. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. 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 And it's because he was getting these questions like, oh, can I have like a square of cheese with my meal? And so he wrote this article, it's, uh, it was called, if it fits your macros, and eat that shit. Um, and so a lot of these kids now, they're, they're eating the Pop-Tarts and stuff like that. And what I would say about this is, is this, um, when you get people who eat as much as bodybuilders do, right? Because we gotta eat a lot of food, right? I mean, back when I was a kid, I was, I used to take clumps of ice cream and put it on my Captain Crunch and then pour half and half cream on that and stuff like that. And, and you know, some of the stuff we've done through, through, our, through everything, I mean, I, I've done some idiotic things, I've done some, some really, you know, good things that were good for my health, but bodybuilding is not necessarily the most healthy sport in the world, and it's separate from fitness, you know? Um, and when we do this, you know, and you're getting eight times a day, you're getting eight insulin spikes a day, what you tend to forget is that you are getting eight insulin spikes a day, regardless of what kind of food you're eating. So you have a tendency toward becoming a pre-diabetic insulin resistant person. Um, and we see that a lot with the older guys because they take some harder, a longer and longer time to lean out. I mean, I remember my first show, I, I got shredded and you know I was eating you know, waffles and things like that. And then when I turned 30, something changed. Um, and you know, it, it, that's the thing. It's, so I found that my body was starting to react negatively um, to what I was doing as a bodybuilder, to things that I thought were healthy. Um, eating opium, I thought that was so healthy for me. I, putting wheat germ in my oatmeal, putting wheat germ in my drinks. Um, I thought, I thought, you know, this is awesome. And then I should go to the doc with a bleeding colon, and I'm like. You know, uh, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I, I eat healthy, I follow an exercise regimen, 
and um, I gave rise to um, a latent problem in my genetics. And, and uh, that's what we don't think about. If you are going to do something, you need to know, you need to understand how your body's reacting. If you drink a protein shake and you have to run to the toilet 20 minutes later, that's not necessarily healthy. I used to drink one and I'd, I'd have gastric problems. I'd be like, screw that, I'm getting big, I don't care. You know? But if your body's reacting negatively to something, you need to understand, you need to pay attention to that. Uh, and if you're not, then you're kind of throwing yourself under the bus. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. Um, I'm Chris Albert. My email is uh, getting to shredded at gmail.com. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Check out his YouTube. His, his YouTube uh, page is pretty entertaining. Uh, yeah. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Cool. Cool. No, 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 yeah. no. no. <laughs> 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 I'm not going to